So this is Nutrition Tactics Talks, the show where we, uh, a bunch of nutrition and exercise scientists, talk about nutrition and exercise science. And if you're unlucky, we'll throw in a bad joke here and there. So I'm here with Milan Betts, who is uh, doing research in how to optimize muscle mass via increasing blood flow. I'm here with Alejandra uh, Monzegui, who's uh, mainly interested in how to keep older adults uh, healthy and fit. And Gas Fuchs, who's interested in assessing muscle mass and function via uh, non-invasive scanning techniques. My name is Joran Trommela, and my research is mostly focused on how to increase muscle mass via protein supplementation. So the topic of today is muscle tissues. And most of our audience is mostly interested in the opposite, uh, namely optimizing muscle mass and doing a lot of exercise. So why are we going to discuss muscle tissues? Well, it's because you can't always avoid it. So what is muscle tissues? Well, it's pretty much the opposite of uh, exercise. So exercise has many health benefits. Uh, it increases muscle mass. Muscle tissues is, yeah, as I mentioned, the opposite where you can lose muscle mass extremely rapidly and it has quite potent detrimental effects on health. So you want to avoid it as much as possible. And muscle tissues, you can see it on a spectrum. Um, for example, during uh, the lockdown, uh, you'll, you won't leave your house as much as you used to. Probably a daily step count is uh, quite a bit lower. So that's a light form of muscle tissues. And probably one of the worst forms of muscle tissues would be uh, when you're in a coma, where you're for weeks or even months, um, you're completely not using any of your muscles. And... Uh, what can you do about it other than trying to prevent it? Unfortunately, at this point, we haven't really figured that out. Um, so things like nutrition that are quite effective at increasing muscle mass gains when combined with exercise, for example, um, don't seem to be very effective at uh, preventing muscle loss from muscle tissues. So the key will really be to prevent it as much as possible. So uh, guys, I'm uh, wondering, has any of you ever had a period of uh, muscle tissues? Maybe ever you've broken a limp and it was casted, or maybe you've been in bed sick for two weeks, or any interesting stories? I once uh, was very inactive when I was running a bed rest study. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I'm uh, not sure if I was inactive, but I was very, very bad for my metabolic health, that's for sure. And I lost a lot of a lot of weight. Yeah, so and that, your muscle tissues is not necessarily what we as scientists would discuss, uh, would, would refer to as muscle tissues, because that's kind of people who are like normally active, who all of a sudden are barely active. But you went from, you know, quite fit to all of a sudden having no time to train. So that is, of course, the exact same principle, but you just went from pretty good to less good. Well, uh, from epic to very, very bad. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so no broken limbs? Yeah, I uh, I had actually my uh, upper leg broken. Oh, that's not the, the first I, one you would think of. No. And I was uh, five, I think. And I had like this small, uh, small bike, like uh, kind of like a small mountain bike or something. And I was just racing around the street. I think on my own um, and then I just wanted to kind of get up a like sidewalk and I kind of slipped and my leg so my upper leg just kind of hit like the sidewalk like this and just kind of broke and twisted and it was really messed up and I just lay there and then some of the people who lived there they just like thought like ah he's just he has some pain i'll just bring him home so they basically just like pick me up put me like uh, to my house and i'm just thinking about it like that's fucking dangerous man if your femur is broken but like all the arteries there um so yeah and then i came home and my mom thought i was just kind of like uh, a cry baby like oh, come on it can't be that bad you can't see anything 
and then uh, like uh, like at some point she noticed that it it was pretty bad, <laughs> and then we went to the hospital and uh, it was really fucked up. How old were you back then? What? How old were you back then? I was five. So they had to put like metal pins in in my leg, and I had to stay at the hospital for like a couple of weeks, I think. Yeah. I think that's even extra bad because you were so young and it was all still like in a, you know, growing phase and stuff. That's even more tricky. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I think afterwards, maybe because you're so young, you can also like recover and get back to to developing. Yeah, true. Maybe maybe, maybe also depend on the type of it. Because I remember uh, once that a young, young guy uh, broke his, his arm. And because he was so young, they were really worried if it would grow properly. Um, so, yeah. Kaz, do you think it's possible that Milan's broken leg in his growing face explains his weird facial structure? <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe something did go wrong there. I was also wondering which of the three legs did you actually grow? Like? <laughs> okay, the, the I biggest think one. we're going to have to move on. <laughs> No, well, I, I do actually have an on-topic question, uh, Milan. So, yeah, you were probably too young, uh, but do you remember that, like, your uh, your broken leg, like, did it have to catch up in uh, in muscle mass, for example, or uh, you don't really remember? I, yeah, honestly, I can remember the the photos that we have in the photo book, then that we just got the cast removed. Yeah, I guess it was it was smaller uh, than than the other leg, but I can't really remember. But what I do remember is that um, with that leg, I uh, had to do like uh, physical therapy sessions and uh, actually was uh, allowed to do some leg pressing and stuff. And I can remember that I like really liked it back then. I was like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> the start of your career. Yeah. And now Five you make uh, fun of people who do the leg press. Only, only squats, right? Only five-year-olds do leg press. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, Kas, you uh, referenced your bed rest study. So, can you talk a little bit uh, about it? Like, how, how, what's the principle? Why, why would you do something like that? Uh, why are you interested as a researcher? Um, just, yeah, yeah, share your experience, please. Yeah, so as you already mentioned a bit at the start, so bed rest is, is relevant um, for scientific purposes because obviously people can uh, be ill or they can be um, very injured or can even go if you go to the really bad side of things to, into a coma. So that kind of requires people to be bed rested for, for like, it can be short, but it can also be for a longer period of time. I think the average is about a week or something, but... Either way, it's of course relevant because there are definitely uh, many people, but and probably everyone at some point will be subjected to bed rest because some, if you get really ill, you have to simply stay in bed because if you stand up, you are so ill that you want to go back to bed again. So in other words, um, it's relevant for, for, for everyone, for, for all of us. And we want to know what is actually happening from a physiological side uh, point, point of view. If you are bed rest, it's what happens in our body um what happens physiologically um so do we how much muscle mass for example if we focus on, on that topic do we actually lose how much muscle strength do we lose what happens metabolically um with within our muscle cells um and also just general health things such as like um insulin resistance for example which we know can occur how bad is it um What's the, the relation with uh, being inactive, for example, to bed rested and getting certain metabolic diseases? I mean, I can, can keep continuing uh, on these kind of, kind of topics, but it's like a lot of, we know that it's kind of bad for your, for your general health. And we know that there's quite a lot of happening, such as, again, losing muscle mass, losing strength, uh, becoming more insulin resistant, which is then could eventually lead to, to getting metabolic disease, such as diabetes uh, type two, for example, uh, et cetera. Um, so it's definitely relevant because it can happen to all of us. Uh, we want to understand what's happening in the body. And then I think the next important thing is, and that's also a, a point where we are in, in, in the scientific field now, is how can we actually uh, counteract a lot of these detrimental effects? So are there ways indeed that we can perform or strategies that we can perform to counteract the negative effects of being bed rested? 
And that's what I was, that I'm, I'm still interested in. And that's also what I did in a research study. And I can't obviously um, say too much about it yet because it hasn't been published. Um, but I mean, I did um, give a presentation on this on like an international conference already. And it's, it's uh, basically the principle to see if, if there are neat strategies or is a certain strategy, if it works to, to counteract the loss in muscle mass and strength. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's, basically what we did. I mean, I can go a little bit deeper into the topic if you want, Jorn. But, uh, well, I'm, I'm kind of interested. So how long did you uh, put people in a bath? And then what does does that mean? Are they uh, are they not allowed to come out of bed at all? Are they allowed to go to the toilet? And like, uh, can you give us a ballpark number of how much muscle do they lose? Is it like half a kilogram? Is it two kilograms? Uh, just so we have a little sure. bit of an idea of how bad is this? Yeah, so the study I did was two weeks of bed rest. And that means, uh, I mean, you have roughly speaking two types of bed rest in, in the scientific field. One is like the more, let's say the clinical based bed rest. So what, you happen, what happens if you go to the hospital, if you have to lay there, uh, you can still sit upright, for example, watch television, uh, etc. You also have the, um, the, the the type of bed rest where your head is a little bit tilted down. It's about 6%. And that's of, often used to, um, to mimic kind of what happens into space. So you kind of have a bit more of the blood flow going towards your brain, which also happens if you are in like an anti-gravity kind of environment. Um, that's, that's kind of mimicking that kind of uh, idea. Um, so I did the first one. So more uh, what happens if you are just subjected to, to bed rest in a hospital, for example. Um, so people were allowed to sit upright. They were allowed to read a book, to watch television, to play games, etc. But they were not allowed to leave the bed for any reason. Um, so they had to stay in the bed. They had to do all their needs on the bed too. So uh, they got like a flask, for example, to pee in if, if they had to. I'm not going to talk about the other thing because it also had to do be, to happen on the bed and there were people like me who had to collect it. Um, uh, even shout, like yeah, shouting wasn't really, really possible, but they, they could wash themselves, but also all had to, had to happen on the bed. Um, so yeah, that that's interesting because it's indeed, of course, you have to be there the whole time because they are in your facilities and they need to be taken care of in any way. Um, so we, we provided them with nutrition. It was all carefully weighted, et cetera. So we, we knew with certain measurements, the start of the study, how, what their basal metabolic rate was. And then we could calculate what their energy expenditure would be, uh, how much they would need on a day. We, we calculated that carefully, uh, to give them meals during, during the day. So we cooked for them. Uh, we did a yeah, we basically provided everything for them. So actually for some people, it was, there was, there was ha heaven. Because uh, I had some students, they were like, yeah, my, my mom told me that I had to do something to earn some money this over the summer and I didn't want to work. And they, yeah, they got paid quite a lot of money, obviously, because you stay in the facility. And um, they, they just brought their Xbox or PlayStation. They were in the bed. They were just gaming and they got food the whole time. So they basically were like chilling. Yeah, chilling the whole time. Um, so, yeah, for some people, apparently, I mean, I wouldn't be one of them, but it's, it's not that that. Yeah, they don't really care. They, they don't care about being inactive. They just want a game. And then, then if they can also then earn money for it, kind of. We're all uh, like very Twitch uh, gamers. <laughs> so uh, so do you have a bit of an indication of how much they lost in oh, those yeah. two weeks? Yeah, so if you look at this, I will take a bit of a, a lot of studies kind of together. If you look at, uh, let's say I did two weeks, as, as I said, like on average, I think one week is what you would see in hospitalized patients, roughly on average. Of course, it depends on every individual. Uh, between seven to two weeks, you will lose about, let's say, 1.3 to 2 kilograms of, of muscle, or lean body mass, kind of muscle mass. Um, so that's, that's if, you, if you collapse a few studies together, what you would roughly find in, in that period. That's also aligning with what we found in our study. It was about 1.8, but again, it's not published yet. Um, if you look at muscle strength, it's about 10 to 15%, depending on the study that you, that you read, that you, that you will lose. And that's, I mean, if we look at you, Jorn, I think your bench was about 40 kilos now, you want to run? <laughs> that would only be four kilos that you lose. That's not that much, but 
<laughs> I mean, for people that that that, that bench press two hundred kilograms, it's actually you know twenty yeah. or more. So that, well, that's that's kind of my next question. Um, so when you hear those numbers, like, "Ooh, I, I would rather not lose that much," but how many weeks of training is it to build that back? So it's two weeks of bed rest. Can you build the same amount of muscle back? in two weeks of training or does it take way longer? And again, do you have a bit of a ballpark number? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it also is important to, to realize if you are trained at the, at, at the start. So if you have a lot of muscle mass, it seems that you also will lose a bit more. But on the other hand, if you are so well trained that I also think, and I mean, I know the, the last word hasn't been said about muscle memory and all that stuff, but it seems to be quite easier to regain some. But just for the average person that's maybe not uh, that's not that trained at the start or just like an average idea is indeed if you are subjected to one to two weeks of bed rest, so you will lose about that, let's say, an average 1.5 kilograms. And if you look at studies that train guys um, over like a period of time, let's say, yeah, I will tell it about 12 weeks, you'll see a gain of 1.5 kilograms. So I think what you will lose in one, maybe two weeks of being subjected to the bed takes you about 12 weeks to regain, which is, which is a lot. Yeah. And I think uh, many people that are like a fan of going to the gym, they will not really like those numbers and they will probably want to know now even more, what can I do to, to uh, prevent a loss in muscle mass that happens if I have to stay on the bed when I'm ill. Yeah. Well, that's the next thing uh, we're going to cover. Maybe, maybe a quick side note. So um, with, uh, as we get older, we tend to lose muscle mass. And one theory that has been put forward is that it's not necessarily that in daily life, older adults lo lose that much muscle mass, but it's every time they get a flu, then they lose a little bit of muscle mass and they never fully recover from it. So that when young people have issues, uh, they tend to recover from it just because their normal life is challenging, so to speak. Uh, challenging to their muscles but that in older adults every time they have a few days of bed rest because of a flu or whatever every time that's like when they drop down and never really go back up yeah also metabolically you see it i mean what you correctly what you say on that that people really or older people they don't really recover as fast or sometimes not even at all from like a, even a metabolic uh, point of view yeah. so they really seem to struggle way more than young guys mm -hmm. So, uh, Alejandra, so probably a lot of people watching are now like, yeah, but I, I go to the gym like two, three, two, four, maybe even more times uh, per week. So let's say you do like a lower body uh, workout twice a week. Do you then have to worry about uh, like the things we discussed, such as step count or is like once you do heavy squats, your number of steps doesn't really matter anymore because it's relatively easy. What's yeah, I think you kind of answered your own question. <laughs> so yeah, basically like, um, yeah, it's nice to have, you know, lots of steps and get a lot of movement every day. But if you're doing heavy squats twice a week, the stimulus that you get from that is quite a bit more than the 10,000 steps you might not be getting. Uh, so yeah, I think don't have to worry about uh, like, disuse muscle atrophy if you're squatting twice a week for example and what if you're squatting twice a week uh, so Gus talked about bed rest well that was two weeks one when is bed rest becoming bed rest and when is it you're just sleeping and sleeping is good is it like if you're in bed for longer than eight hours now all of a sudden it's bad it's bed rest is it like 24 <laughs> hours if any indication there, or is it like don't don't micro worry? There's no uh, black white switch. Uh, get yeah, your sleep to, in and then just be active. Yeah, exactly. So my understanding, there's it's not like if you're in bed for nine point five hours and all of a sudden you're like entering muscle atrophy zone or something. It's uh, yeah. I mean, as long as you're consistently and and frequently active. So let's say you're yeah sleeping 10 hours a day um but you're like active every other day uh doing like heavy squats or like moderately active every day then you're probably completely fine um because also i mean yeah studies show that in order to kind of maintain uh muscle mass or, or 
prevent atrophy. Um, you don't actually need to be doing that much. You just have to kind of like be doing like, I think it's something like an, one ninth of your of your normal training is enough to keep up your, your muscle. Um, so I think preventing the atrophy is pretty easy um, without having to go crazy with your, your workouts, right? Yeah, so that kind of, when you say that, I, I kind of think of um, of the lockdown. So most people who love the gym, they're super demotivated when the gyms are closed. And like, it's easy for two weeks to do a few home workouts, but pretty soon you start thinking like, why am I doing this? Like these bodyweight squats and uh, maybe you in the beginning you challenge yourself a little bit with like a pistol or a one arm uh, push up but pretty soon you're like okay that's not the same as my real bench press workouts um, would would for that be would the same apply there then like yes maybe it's a relatively easy workout but you don't need that much to maintain yeah for sure I mean I have also like an, an anecdotal evidence of that. Um, so like, yeah, a lot of my friends, they're like really into resistance training. So them go five times a week and like before the lockdown, they were pretty buff. And then after lockdown was over, you could see that they like lost so much muscle. Uh, whereas talking about us, friend, I was like, thinking the exact thing. Just... <laughs> talking about us. <laughs> Yeah, because your your nose clearly super buff before a lockdown. Well, everyone has uh, seen right? our, uh, everyone has <laughs> still not recovered. Everyone has seen our thumbnail, so I don't need to brag in this uh, podcast. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, like my boyfriend, he decided to just like you know do push ups every day, and um, which is way less than let's say a hundred kilo bench. Um, and he maintained his muscle like he looked pretty much exactly the same as he did pre-lockdown. So I think either he's like a crazy specimen or uh, this is a good, yeah, anecdotal evidence of you being able to maintain muscle mass if you're just doing even a bit less than what you're used to. Yeah. Or both. Or both, yeah. <laughs> I think so. So... Uh... Milan, what uh, what exactly is happening during uh, muscle issues? Like, why why are you losing muscle? Like, seems kind of dumb. Uh, if it's that, like Kaz mentioned, it's so difficult to build muscle. Like, it's way slower. So, why is your muscle? Uh, why why do you lose it so rapidly? Is that not a waste? And just mechanistically, why is it why is it going away? How is it going away? So that uh, kind of reminds me of a, I think a course in my bachelor that I was uh, I was following, and it was called "Use It or Lose It." And uh, oh, that, I taught that, that course. <laughs> nice. So that uh, kind of really stuck with me uh, because yeah, it definitely explains exactly what is happening. You need to use your muscles, or you will lose them. Um, so. Yeah, I think with, with inactivity or muscle tissues, it's pretty clear you're not using them so you can lose them. Um, and if you look at more mechanistically, um, it also kind of makes sense because we know that muscle contraction is um, basically the main, um, let's say, anabolic stimulus. And if you take away muscle contraction uh, almost at all, yeah, you don't really have that stimulus of uh, yeah, the, the underlying mechanism, muscle protein synthesis. Um, so you, you always have that balance between muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown. And muscle protein synthesis needs to be uh, greater than the breakdown in order to gain muscle. So I think uh, most of us are familiar with uh, the two main metabolic stimuli. So physical activity uh, and uh, protein ingestion. Um, so if you take away, uh, the physical activity, um, yeah, it gets pretty difficult to have the protein synthesis exceed protein breakdown. Um, so I guess that's, that's kind of, uh, what is happening mechanistically in the body. And to be honest, like it does make sense to a certain extent because like muscle is a quite a, a large 
metabolically active organ like it it basically already takes up a lot of energy to exist right so if you're laying in bed and like basically all your muscle costs a lot of energy and yeah if you're not using it then why the heck do you have it so yeah it does kind of make sense that you lose muscle if you're not using it yeah so uh i'm always uh a bit skeptical of the uh evolutionary theories to explain things like they're always a bit hit or miss so to speak uh, because pretty pretty it's like pretty easy for every diet to explain on for this and this reason we're evolved this way even though 12 different diets say that's how we're evolved um, but in this case i think you're entirely uh spot on um you just don't want to waste you don't want to have a bunch of kilograms of energy costing tissue on you and the funny thing is, it is you actually do want that because that ties into what Gus has uh, mentioned earlier is especially during bed rest, you become very insulin resistant. So you really need that tissue to basically waste energy and uh, take up glucose. So ideally you want it, but the thing is just throughout evolution, uh, starvation has always been the big danger and only relatively recent uh, is it uh, like things like insulin resistance that have been a health challenge. So that adaptation that it goes away because it's costly, metabolically costly, actually would be a great advantage now during uh, bed rest. But let's see what Gus thinks because uh, he's more into this topic uh, than me. Would you agree with that, uh, Gus? Yeah, can I first have a small note? Sure. Something. I love the fact that I can see you from the front and from the back. <laughs> from the window. Yeah, now you're like sitting a little bit more up, but I just was, was enjoying that view, like a oh, double view of I'm yours. pretty sure that just one your is enough for, with the, him. for the viewers. The people <laughs> want more. They want more. <laughs> Sorry, Jan, I had to make that comment. Uh, yeah, can you briefly... So what do you exactly mean? Yeah, so Milan said like that it makes sense that muscle tissue disappears because yeah. if you don't use it, uh, like why do you have it? It just costs energy. It's just a waste, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was kind of saying that throughout history, that makes a lot of sense uh, because starvation has always been like a main danger uh, for humankind. But nowadays, like in the last couple decades it's kind of the opposite like would you say you become very insulin resistant uh, during bed rest um, so actually you do want all that tissue to burn calories to suck up glucose uh, and basically to improve insulin uh, sensitivity um, but that's yeah that's such a reason thing that that is becoming a health risk and not starvation that we're kind of evolved negatively for this specific situation what do you uh, do you agree or is it just one just another weird evolutionary theory that uh, makes no sense no i think it makes sense uh, it is an evolutionary theory it's always indeed like interesting to have those to kind of to like it says set, same thing with what you said about the nutritional diet even though there i have like a lot of times i'm like it's not even true what they're saying yeah. is at least makes sense so i fully agree on that with you um yeah i think indeed if you yeah basically what milan said i mean if you are not active simply what's the purpose of having all this metabolic well high metabolic active tissue around you which is doesn't serve any benefit at least in that those situations i mean now i'm completely going to speculate because uh, but if you if you look at it back in the days and i'm gonna really this comes right from my head right now so maybe i'm gonna miss something you can feel free to interrupt me it's coming from back your in head the days, or somewhere else yeah it's inside what did you say if it's coming from your head or somewhere it's else it's really in, inside of my head right now <laughs> So um, I think, I mean, back in these days, like when we were hunters in a way, then, I mean, you could be inactive for a while, but at some point you had to be active again to, to hunt down some kind of pork or whatever you were looking for, maybe a mammoth, like these big, <laughs> huge ones. Um, so, so there would always be times to be active again and to, to, to get back to, to, let's say, becoming active, maybe to, to grow some muscle again, etc. And I think these days it's like you're inactive and there's never really a reason to become active. 
uh, because I mean, you can always every single day you can order, go to like whatever around the world. There's always like uh, some places where you can order the food online, right, Mila? <laughs> So um, you can just, just, just order some food and you can just stay in the office and work in the evenings. You can order, get food in and you don't have to be necessarily active. You can go to the car, go back home, lay on the bed, etc. cetera. Um, you don't even have to like, and you don't even have to run away for like an, like a dangerous animal, at least not in the Netherlands. So you will, you, you can be very inactive every time. And in that way, indeed, I think the, if, well, if it's true, this evolutionary theory, then it's like negative because it will it could theoretically lead indeed indeed to some metabolic diseases how how was that about my like ali was it good ali Did yeah yeah it was fine <laughs> i think ali so, disagrees with the fact that there are no scary animals because there's, there's lots still, of scary there, animals there's still here. bugs here in the netherlands <laughs> so Huh. Still some scary people around in, in, in the office. Or in the, yeah, in the that's office. true. Some people who look like ghosts, you know. <laughs> so, uh, Alejandra, um, so Milan was saying that um, exercise and uh, nutrition are the two main anabolic stimuli. Uh, then he discussed, so, well, if you don't do a whole lot of exercise, protein synthesis will probably be quite low. Uh, and therefore you're likely to lose muscle mass. Well, then the obvious question, I guess, is can you not just compensate by optimizing your nutrition? You mean like, uh, let's say you are under a period of bed rest, whether nutrition would help prevent... Yeah, so for acting. example, uh, high-protein diets are relatively effective to get a little bit more uh, out of your training program. Um does it also help to slow down muscle loss? Can you even prevent um, muscle tissues, muscle loss? Or can you even gain muscle mass by eating a lot of protein while you're just mm -hmm. laying in bed all day? Because right. if your answer is yes, I'm doing that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, unfortunately, there's not a lot of evidence that, that points to any type of nutritional intervention, uh, like decreasing the loss of muscle uh, if you're not using it. Um, studies give kind of like different answers, but in general, it seems to be that no matter how much protein you eat, you're not going to, uh, yeah, stop your muscles from, from decreasing in size, um, not even by a bit. And there's even some studies that show that like it accelerates, uh, the muscle loss, but yeah, I, I don't know exactly if I believe that, but. In general, yeah, it seems that there's no there's no hope in that in that sense. Yeah, so any any clue why that why that is? Like protein um, should work, like it's the building block of muscle. So if you give it a lot, like why do, why do you break down your muscles if you get the building blocks in? Any, yeah. Any? So my I guess like idea of that is that. Um, the really like strong main stimulus of muscle growth is muscular contraction so exercise um, and nutrition does help with that um, and and certain amino acids can help stimulate muscle protein synthesis but uh, in the end you, it seems that you really need to have muscle contraction in order to stimulate your muscles to grow yeah so uh, yeah exercise is exercise like increases the sensitivity to your protein so if exercise is completely gone your sensitivity to protein is pretty much gone so your body exactly. basically forgot what to do with it uh <laughs> Kas, so milan talked a little bit about exercises uh, the main anabolic stimuli and uh, alejandra talked a little bit about protein that in some cases is an anabolic stimuli not being very effective but i know that you are interested in a third anabolic stimuli and another very cool study <laughs> going on uh, on that topic. Now I think uh, you know what I'm talking about. So no, uh, no? <laughs> <laughs> well maybe it pops up in this head again somewhere. All right, but so, it, it sounds now that you're kind of saying like, us, are you using that stuff?" Or? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, anabolic steroids. Would yeah. those be able um, like? Obviously, we're not necessarily advocating um, for that. Um, if you're a bodybuilder and you know what you do, uh, sure. Um, but if you're if you end up in a hospital for one or two weeks, um, you know, taking steroids for two weeks is probably 
not going to give you a heart attack, but theoretically could be quite effective to prevent muscle loss. Um, mm -hmm. Any takes on that? Yeah, no, I, the first thing what you said, I think is interesting because it's it's right. We always say there are two main anabolic stimuli. And of course, it's 100% it's true. But we never really talk about the third, which indeed is the use of anabolic steroids. Um, but I mean, clearly, if you're exercising a lot and at some point you, you're not really progressing anymore, if you then use steroids, you see massive, at least massive, you will see the progression again. Uh, that that's obvious and we know that from studies we see that in practice like the big bodybuilders are all using steroids obviously so indeed what you say the question is i mean if we're inactive so we nutrition doesn't do much uh, exercise doesn't or you can't really exercise so it's it's not even an option do steroids work i think i mean we there was a study done in our lab a couple of years ago um and there it was found that if you at least was nandrolone decanoat, so deca, uh, a lot of people know it as just deca, uh, that was injected for 200 milligrams at the start of the immobilization period. And then they found basically no difference. So if you inject, and I know 200 milligrams of deca in the bodybuilding world is not that much. It's considered not as like a huge uh, bolus of, 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 of steroids on a weekly basis. Um, but it is, yeah, I mean, of course, you, you can't simply say to the ethical committee, we're going to inject as um, as much as we can because we or like very high amounts because we want to see if it's working. There are also some ethical constraints to to that, that this kind of stuff in healthy volunteers. So I'm still curious if we would inject higher doses than that, if that would be any of any benefit. At least what we can say so far, if it's that dose with that specific um, uh, steroid, which is very anabolic, uh, then we don't really see a benefit. Uh, but I also have to say there, I'm aware of like a study from, I think it was the early 2000s or the late 90s, where they also injected, I think it was also 200 milligrams of DECA over 12, 10 or 12 weeks. And they assessed the muscle fiber growth in like the, the shoulders. And they also didn't really see any difference compared to if they didn't do it. So again, I think the question is, okay, so far it doesn't seem to be very promising, but would, would have been the dose been high enough, yes or no? And also, um, yeah, would that stand outweigh like the potential downside effects? I mean, I still think if you would do it once, uh, there's not a big problem. Of course, it depends on if you have any underlying stuff. And again, I don't want to advocate it at all, but you, um, you always, I think, have to think about if you give more Will that have some maybe more detrimental side effects? Yes or no? Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's possible that higher amounts are working, but we don't know yet. At least we can say with this relatively low amount, it doesn't seem to do anything. Um, Gus, based on um, that study. So if you give like, are there any studies or evidence that if you give 200 milligrams um, of these steroids to someone like who's not in bed rest or someone who's like training, if that would actually have an effect on their muscle mass growth compared to not doing it just for like one bolus because that was what was given in the study right yeah no no if you would do just one bolus you mean yeah yeah so exactly the same as in the study but not bed rest people who are training as usual what would that happen yeah i think if i would now start training i would only once inject myself with 200 milligrams of deca or like nandrolone um, yeah. if I, if yeah <laughs> no, no, if he did really it only think. once instead of like every week <laughs> if i don't think that gives me much benefit maybe um the only thing i was thinking of is like we know that sleep is important for your the natural testosterone levels and as you guys know the, the listeners don't uh, so the last when was it the last tuesday i had like a 24-hour test day so i didn't sleep at all um, I was always wondering if you would then inject small amounts, would that have any benefit on your, like, let's say normal testosterone levels, if they will be that much reduced by sleep restriction or sleep deprivation? It's possible. And it's possible that then could counteract maybe some, some associated losses that could occur over, a, if you would do this over a long period of time. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm still curious about these things, if you could then kind of rescue something. But of course, yeah, no one would just in a row have 24 hours without sleep because it's not even possible. 
But I don't think, based on your specific question, Ali, if I would do it now in like a normal situation, that I would have any benefit. Yeah, I exactly. think you have to do it for longer periods of time and potentially even use a little bit more. But yeah. Yeah, because I'm thinking that if it wouldn't even enhance someone who is um, having the stimulus of muscular contraction, then why should it enhance uh, or prevent uh, muscle atrophy and bed rest? So, I, so yeah, unfortunately, to the like ethical constraints that you can't uh, do more, but that would be quite interesting to see mm -hmm. what would happen. No. So um, we discussed that nutrition doesn't seem to be all that effective. We discussed um, that uh, even uh, steroids may not be the solution either. Uh, there's one more weird thing that we tried in our lab because we tried, well, probably what you have tried causes the weirdest of them all. Like by now the, the, the viewers are like, what the heck is this Kasse guy doing in Maastricht? All these weird studies, 24 hours, this subjects in bed, this many weeks. Um, I think we can kind of say it. I mean, nah, let's keep it secret. Let's just do a big massive Twitch stream when, uh, when it's uh, out. <laughs> But uh, we've tried one more uh, silly thing. Do you know what I'm referring to, Milan? Uh, I think I do. I uh, have never personally done it, but maybe you and Gus have. So I know that at some point in our lab, we, uh, like people before me, uh, they did a study where they basically give like electric shocks to a muscle so that it contracts um but yeah i'm not sure did you guys also like experience that because i'm super curious like i would love to just experience it once um but i i have never so we should have the equipment still in our department and if you're super curious i'll it will be my pleasure to help you <laughs> Just a tiny shock. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's it. basically <laughs> just uh, a dial. So you just sl slowly dial it up. But so for the viewers, it's called uh, neuromuscular electric stimulation. Maybe you've seen seen it on Telcel or something, uh, which are like commercial bad versions of it. Uh, we of course have like official research products. What so, do you mean bad versions? I use them to get my six pack overnight. It works, works, works very good. Because you didn't have an overnight, you stayed up all night. So um, it's basically just <laughs> electrodes that you attach to the muscle at various locations. You give a small electric shock and uh, as a result, your muscle will contract. Now, if you're just a healthy guy, uh, that's not going to do a whole lot because that contraction is smaller than your normal use of your muscle. Um, however, when you're um, in a cast, for example, so if Milan breaks his leg again, so maybe that we should do that as part of your <laughs> experiment. When you break your leg and it's costed, you, you simply can't use that limp or that muscle. Um, so what we did is we cut out a small piece of the cast just so that we could put the electrodes through and attach them to the muscle. And then, um, yeah, just give them the small shock so that the muscle contracts. It's just an isometric contraction because obviously you can't actually flex your leg. You're still in that cast. But that alone was enough to challenge the muscle enough to prevent uh, some of the muscle loss. So... That comes a little bit down to what uh, Alejandro referred earlier. You don't need that much stimulation to uh, reduce muscle loss. Uh, if you can somehow get some muscle contraction, that's quite effective. Uh, but just a regular person wouldn't benefit from it. Uh, it's really to prevent loss, not necessarily to uh, to gain anything. Uh, but maybe Cass's belly was that deconditioned that it helped <laughs> for him. So uh, have you uh, have you experienced uh, the NMES uh, cos? I haven't had it on myself. I've seen it. Yeah. Um, oh shit! Now I now I kind of said that I didn't use the Telcel stuff. <laughs> I should have said that. Oh, now, I, um, you had I, me. You totally had me. Now you ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've seen it. Uh, I've also heard people talking about it. So it's quite it's quite uh, quite weird because I can imagine because your muscles are contracting, but it's not like you're not doing the kind of you're not sending the signals to your muscle it yeah. just happens so because a good way to describe it is like if you do like a peg bounce right and you try to do it relatively fast 
your pack bounces like maybe twice a second and it goes like flip, 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 flip. Like it's very difficult to do like <laughs> 10 bounces a second. And that's like for any muscle that you contract. If you contract your quad just isometrically, maybe you contract it once a second. But the uh, electrical stimulation is like super high frequency. And it's mm -hmm. almost like you see your muscle wave. Like it, it contracts like for like a microsecond and releases again. It's yeah, it's super weird. Maybe I'll have to make a video it's, it's kinda, sometime to, uh, it's to, interesting to show it to the viewers. Yeah, Sorry. what you say, you're, you're fully right. It's also high frequency. I think they're also using now low frequency as a recovery strategy after exercise. Mm. And even, and that's I think more with the idea to kind of get the blood flow going in the area to, you know, have like all those benefits. Uh, but I think maybe just a small piece to go back what you just said. I, I've heard about coaches or like trainers that are like using indeed electro stimulation in the gym on people and i'm like what are they what are they doing because as you said i mean it's it's it could be beneficial if you're in the bed and you can't contract your muscle yourself but even people are using it now apparently in a way that you're already maximally contracting in the gym etc yeah so if i wrap everything up uh and try to make some practical advice from it unless uh, any of you have uh a topic they would like to pitch in no i think maybe one thing would be interesting well, like if you look at supplements apart from the protein what ali discussed i think uh, some studies about creatine for example people have been thinking maybe that could be beneficial um during actual issues it doesn't really seem to be that beneficial uh, fish oil is a bit more recent some let's say um interesting results that seem to be, there could be some benefits, a study um, in young young females, but I think also it needs more research. Um, but I think in, like overall, and we can say there's not really that much of a benefit, but there are still people investigating several strategies. And I think fish oil, there will be some more work on to see if it's really, if these data can be confirmed and if, we, if this can be an interesting strategy or not. By the next quarantine, the next I'll, uh, I'll buy a bunch of fish oil and uh, try it out. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, the main thing is just try to avoid any form of uh, muscle tissues as much Absolutely. as possible. Yeah. The good news is you don't need to do that much. Like, yes, push-ups are probably not going to increase your muscle mass uh, uh, unless you did no training before. But, you know, just somewhat slightly challenging body uh, weight variants. You can play around with it. You don't need to do that much to at least maintain uh, maintain your, um, your muscle mass and function. Uh, and the same thing kind of applies uh, for older adults. Like, um, so we typically think of like when, when someone, like let's say that uh, your parents are in the hospital uh, you kind of want to take care of them and you take them in the wheelchair to, to the toilet. But if it's possible, try to let them walk a little bit. And maybe they can only walk for like 25 steps and then they need to rest in the wheelchair. You just stay there for a couple of minutes. Then you have another short walk again. If you do a little bit like that, it's almost like resistance exercise training for either older adults or someone who is recovering from an injury or sickness. So don't underestimate that how much a little bit can already do for someone. Um, but obviously I hope that uh, no one in the audience uh, will uh, experience any form of issues uh, when possible. So um, yeah, I think we've discussed enough. I think we should get up from our chairs and uh, get some movement in. Thank Guys, it's a great idea. Thanks again so no, for no. being here, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow at the office. See ya. See ya.